Thanks for listening to this podcast from Council on the Ageing Victoria. Every Age Counts is an advocacy campaign aimed at tackling ageism against older Australians. At Cota Victoria, we're partnering in this project to learn more, spread the word and embrace ageing. In November 2019, we were excited to host a talk by internationally renowned age discrimination expert Ashton Applewhite. Ashton is the author of This Chair Rocks, a manifesto against ageism, and she speaks all over the world about age as a criterion for diversity. Addressing a packed room at Cota Vic, Ashton was introduced by Dr Kirsty Nolan, Executive Director of the Benevolent Society and the Co-Chair of the Every Age Counts campaign. Thank you. When I was recruited to lead advocacy at the Benevolent Society, the mandate I was given was to come in and to identify a wicked problem that needed fixing and then to, you know, do something about it. When we started to think about what the issues were that we could focus on, we found many for older people. We found poverty, we found inequality, we found housing issues, we found social inclusion, we found loneliness. But as we started to identify each and every one of those problems, we came up against the issue that underpinned each and every one of them, which is that we value some lives more than others. And the name we give to this is ageism. So the task is to name those awkward, uncomfortable acts of internal or external discrimination for what they are. And so we are delighted to have with us on a full Australian tour the extraordinarily delightful, compelling leader or one of the international leaders of this movement, Ashton Applewhite. Thank you. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and to convey my respect to elders past, present and emerging. We have so much to learn about how indigenous people in the US as well um, treat the life course and in particular people towards the end of it. The world all of us share is going to contain a lot more older people. In the Paleolithic era, the emergence of a third living generation enabled modern humans to flourish. It's called the grandmother hypothesis, if any of you have heard of that. The emergence of a third generation enabled music and art and the passing on of knowledge. So just think, the emergence in our lifetimes of a fourth and even a fifth living generation is another tectonic shift. Longevity obviously is a fundamental hallmark of human progress and this gives us an unprecedented opportunity to tap into the social capital and economic capital of millions more healthy, well-educated adults than ever before in human history. What stands in the way? Ageism. We experience it any time someone assumes we are too old for something instead of finding out who we are and what we're capable of, or too young. Ageism cuts both ways. I think it's really important to point that out. Younger people experience a lot of it. It's any judgment about a person or a group of people based on how old we think they are. Ageism is everywhere. When old pals cringe at public mention of how long they've known each other instead of savoring their shared history, when singles feel compelled to lie about their age on dating sites, in those marketing checklists, you know, 18 to 22 and 23 to so on, that end at 65, or if not before, as though everyone over 65 buys the same stuff and does the same things. In fact, the longer we live, the more different from one another we become. So the older we are, the less that number says about what we're capable of, interested in, anything about us. We are bombarded by negative messages about age and aging from childhood on, starting with children's books and cartoons. Wrinkles are ugly. Old people are incompetent. Old people are sad. No one makes money off satisfaction. That is, of course, what propels all the you know, body image stuff that you're never you know, thin enough, white enough, uh, blonde enough. And if aging is framed as a problem or a disease, as it is so often, then we can be persuaded to buy stuff to stop it or cure it. In other words, our fears about aging are stoked by social and economic forces. People profit from them. 
and what a market because everyone is going to come down with it. Does anyone in this room really think they are a lesser version, less interesting, less fun in bed, less valuable than the person they used to be? If so, think about where those messages come from and what purpose they serve. What else does ageism do? Like all prejudice, it pits us against each other. Think about the prevailing metaphor for population aging, a gray tsunami, which summons up a frankly terrifying vision of this wave of old people poised on the horizon to swamp our pension systems and our social care systems and suck all the good stuff out to sea before young people get any of it. Scaling up support for longer lives will be an immense challenge. I'm not a Pollyanna. There are huge structural issues here. But what we're facing is no tsunami. It is the best studied demographic phenomenon in history, and it is not crashing on a defenseless shore. It is a deficit accounting. It omits all the ways in which older people contribute socially and economically, not just in, in conventional ways by staying on the job longer or perhaps by watching a grandchild so the parents can go make money, but in con countless other harder to measure ways. For example, looking in on other older people so the state doesn't have to pay people to do that. And worst of all, most problematic, this alarmic, alarmist rhetoric justifies resentment and fear of older people and makes our welfare seem less of a human right. Framing population as a zero-sum, kids versus canes proposition is wrong-headed for so many ways. Reasons. It is not ethical or legal to allocate resources by race or by sex, and it is equally unacceptable to weigh the needs of the young against the old. So listen for that argument, and if you hear it, don't get bogged down into how much we spend on reject the argument out of hand. It's not okay as a starting point for a discussion. This way of thinking also fails the common sense test. Older people are not them, they are us. They are our parents, our spouses, our neighbors, our friends, ourselves. If society doesn't help support a decent old age, who's going to end up taking care, of course, of our grandparents and us in turn? and communities that are good to grow old in, which means that they have public transportation and they're accessible and they have parks and social services. They're good for everyone. They're good for commuters. They're good for families. So I like to frame this. Um, there's a lot of talk about age-friendly communities, tons of stuff, age-friendly cities gaining ground in the US. Uh, it's a World Health Organization in initiative. Frame them as all age-friendly. Partly because then it can't be framed as, why are we doing all this expensive stuff for old people or people with disabilities? We're doing it to make a more livable communities for everyone. Aging is not a problem or a disease. It is a powerful, natural, lifelong process that unites us all. It's the one universal human experience. Aging is not the problem. Discrimination is the problem. It's not being women that makes life harder for women. It's sexism. It's not loving a man that makes life harder for gay guys. It's homophobia. And it is not the passage of time that makes getting older so much harder than it has to be. It is ageism. So the more clearly we see these forces at work, right, can step out and see these external forces, the easier it is to envision alter alternative, more positive, and more accurate narratives, right? Not because this is happy talk, but because as a fact-based corrective to the conventional tsunami, it's all going to suck decline. And the longer we wait to challenge those forces, the more damage they do. The workforce, as we're pointed out all the time, is where most people experience this age discrimination first, uh, arguably more men. It is, interestingly, the first form of discrimination that many white men encounter. So I'm looking for some of them to uh, join forces. Um, I'm 67. I'm typical of the growing numbers of older people who are expanding the definition of working age. What does that word even mean anymore? What does retirement mean? You know, and the, the fact that we don't know what those mean is not a failure. It's a sign that these systems are in flux. And yet age discrimination in the workplace is rampant. Not one negative stereotype about older workers holds up under scrutiny. Uh, I think a really good um, way for you to challenge um, some of those, the, the way people think about it is to ask, because we all know that diversity 
in the workplace is good, that diverse companies are more profitable, they're better places to work, is simply to ask people what they think of as criteria for diversity. And most people don't say age. And if you say, what about age, not in a gotcha way, but to provoke a little bit of that discomfort that Kirsty is talking about, no one says, oh, that's a dumb idea. No one says, let me get back to you. You know, So just like race and gender and all the rest, age is a criterion for diversity. Ageism harms our health. There's a growing body of fascinating research that shows that attitudes towards age and aging affect the way our minds and bodies function at the cellular level. People, I used to say with more positive feelings towards aging, now I say with a more realistic attitude towards aging, right? That's fact-based rather than fear-based. We walk faster, live longer, heal better, and that's why the World Health Organization is developing a global anti-ageism campaign, right? Not, not, it's not a, an aging services organization, it's the World Health Organization to extend not just lifespan, but health span. Ageism disproportionately affects women. We earn less, we're forced out of the labor market by caregiving responsibilities, which are often unpaid as is much women's work or paid much less. We have smaller pensions or none at all, and we live longer. We see this from, I know, in Australia, and it's probably the same in the US, that the growing, fastest growing percentage of Australia's homeless population is older women. The effects of this discrimination are compounded not just by sexism, but by race and class, which is why everywhere in the world, the poorest of the poor and sickest of the sick are old women of color. Ageism feeds ableism and vice versa. Aging and, and disability are not the same, of course, and it's important, you know, th these conversations are always double-edged. It's important to resist that equation, but on the other hand, we tend to ignore the overlap, and that's a real problem, too, because it just reinforces dual stigma. Many older people refuse wheelchairs or walkers because the stigma is so great, even when it means never leaving home. Think about that. I mean, I've heard terrible stories about that. Cognitive impairment, I think because we can't see it, is even more stigmatized. Alzheimer's is a terrible disease, but the flip side of that coin is that, is that uh, dementia rates are falling significantly. How come we never hear that? Again, it's not that it's not a tremendous public health threat. It's that our fears are out of proportion to the reality, and that fear itself is bad for it. There, a study came out of Yale last year that showed that people with more realistic attitudes towards aging that don't automatically equate it with disease and decline are less likely to develop dementia, even if they have the gene that predisposes them to the disease. Let's run with that. Ageism corrupts our end-of-life discussions. The problem is cast in terms of numbers of growing numbers of old people who inconveniently refuse to die when the changing, the underlying issue is the changing nature of healthcare, right? Healthcare costs are not rising in percentage of, you know, of the number of old people in the population. That's another common myth. They're rising because of the increasingly expensive technological nature of healthcare. At any age and in any condition, along with the right to opt out, every person, in my opinion, every person has the right to want to stay alive, regardless of physical condition or age. Ageism segregates us. Think about, I mean, it cuts us off from most of humanity, especially in the US. I, I'm, everything is worse in the United States. I'm just going to start just saying that. I'm sure it's true. Look at our president. <laughs> um, where, where remarkably few people, it's tiny, single digits, have a close friend defined as someone they would talk, um, discuss a close personal matter with, more than 10 years younger or older than them, which isn't even half a generation. So think how, how myopic that makes our worldview and our social circle. So, and it's, it'd be great to see, and I'm, I'm curious about uh, analogies here, there are tons of intergenerational initiatives coming up in the US that are not explicitly tied to the movement against ageism, but of course, structurally, integration is always the antidote. The minute there's a mixed age group in the room, whether you're trying to you know, end ageism or, or clean the you know, community garden, you are, you are dismantling ageism simply by having all ages at the table. 
Ageism age, is a global human rights and social justice issue. So, you know, the task in a sense is just to, to hitch age to these other forms of discrimination with which we are more familiar. Just like hitching age to the list of criteria for diversity, the ground is plowed in a lot of ways, way more than it was 60 years ago when the women's movement started getting off the ground. We're not starting from, from zero here. If these are new ideas, but the momentum is there. We just have to you know, tap people on the shoulder and say, yo, what, a, what about age? Um, Almost two-thirds of people over 60 around the world find it hard to get health care. Almost three-quarters say they may not have enough money for basic services like housing, decent housing and food and electricity. So most of our children and grandchildren or our children's, um, you know, we don't have to have them. There are many young people we care about, whether or not we happen to be biologically related to them. They're going to live to be 100 if they're lucky. And is this the world we want them to inherit? You know, this is really a huge issue that affects everyone. Until we dismantle ageism, it will pit the generations against each other. It will rob society of an immense accrual of knowledge and experience. And it will poison our futures by framing longer lives as a problem instead of the remarkable opportunity they also represent. That's, you know, both sides of the coin here. The social capital of millions more healthy, well-educated adults than ever before in human history. To take advantage of this longevity dividend, we need to quit the reflexive hand-wringing and challenge these ageist thinkings and stereotypes that the, that the Benevolent Society's campaign is doing such a fantastic idea of foregrounding. And they did not pay me to say that. It is really an amazing campaign that I am honored to be part of. And think realistically and imaginatively about how to shape this mixy-uppy, multi-generational world that we all hope to live long enough to inhabit. It's not all ageism. The, the rules and institutions around us were created when lives were shorter. And they haven't had time to catch up, right? So we have this window of opportunity, but that's why calling out the ageism around these sort of lazy and uninformed ways of thinking is so important right now. This will require nothing less than a mass movement, like the 20th century movement that catalyzed a mass shift of consciousness for women around the world. So it is really exciting to be able to announce that a global movement to end ageism is underway around the world. Last year, campaigns kicked off from Colorado to Canberra, with Australia leading the way. Yours is the first national anti-ageism campaign. Others have cropped up since then, but you know, you're setting an incredible standard. Um, three years ago, I had the honor of addressing the United Nations on the International Day of Older Persons. And I gave a take no prisoners talk called End Ageism or the Rest is Noise. Because as Kirsty pointed out, we are not going to achieve equal rights across the lifespan in any arena, in healthcare, in uh, you know, abuse from children, you know, eight-year-olds to 80-year-olds, in the workplace, in our private lives, unless we address fundamental culture change. And last month, it was incredibly exciting to see organizations and individuals around the world, governments, private people, you know, individual, all different kinds of, of coalitions, Kenya, Chile, Bangladesh, Ireland, Santiago, all around the world target ageism as the overarching obstacle to equal rights across the lifespan. And just since then, just it, since October, Boston, San Francisco, Wales have since launched anti-ageism initiatives. Wales is catching up, so be sure to compete. You can learn a lot more about these. It's, it's, it's really, it's rare to have tangible, measurable evidence of social change. So I want to tell you all about Old School, which is oldschool.info is the website. It's a clearinghouse of free, vetted anti-ageism resources. We launched it a year ago, August. We had to add a campaign section last December. It is probably the fastest growing section, so you can learn about all these initiatives there. Please, and the fact that it, that is growing, and these are not how to live forever, this is not how to be healthy, these are anti-ageism political campaigns. 
So that really, the growth of that is measurable evidence that this is underway. Um, please bookmark the site, oldschool.info. Sign up for the newsletter because, once again, we won't give it away and we won't write you very often because we've secured funding to develop Old School into a hub for movement building activities of all kinds, which is really exciting. If you, do, if you, don't, if you need something that you can't find it on there, make it and send it in. Right? We don't make money off it, and you can brand it however you want. Let's, let's, the Every Age Counts uh, Drivers of Ageism report is on there. It's fantastic. We're putting up your report on ageism and aged care. So one of the things is, you know, how do we build it out internationally? You know, maybe we'll end up with satellites for different countries, different issues. We're figuring that out. You have any smart ideas, send them our way. Until we put a stop to it, ageism will oppress us all. This makes it a perfect target for collective advocacy. In the um, dark days after um, Trump was elected, I thought, you know, gee, with all these other, um, you know, forms of discrimination seemingly ascendant, racism in particular, do we really have time for another one? And then it dawned on me, you know, that we don't have to choose. That when we make the world a better place to grow old in, we make it a better place in which to be a woman, to have a disability, to be non-rich, to be non-white. And of course, when we show up at all ages for whatever cause, people have to come at this in their own way at their own time. But any effort, no matter how small, helps shift the culture a little bit. And just by coming together at all ages for whatever cause matters most, we dismantle ageism. So a movement's underway. We're in it. Hope you'll join me. Thank you. That's Ashton Applewhite, ageing activist, speaking there as part of the Every Age Counts campaign at the Council on the Ageing Headquarters in Victoria. Mm -hmm.